friends, and welcome to yet another video from my series Quick Thoughts On, in which I always talk about different stories from the rich Star Trek universe. 30 years and 2 days ago, NBC aired the next episode from the classic Star Trek show, called And the Children Shall Lead. And these are my honest opinions about it. The Enterprise responds to a distress call coming from the planet Triacus, sent by Professor Starnes, when the landing party, consisting as usually of Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock and Dr. McCoy, beams down, they find out a bunch of corpses. Isn't that how every great episode should start? With a bunch of corpses? One of them, however, seems still to be alive and it's Starnes himself. But he doesn't seem to recognize Kirk and falls down dead very soon. They find out that all of the adults in the expedition committed suicide, when they suddenly get to meet the villains of this episode, a bunch of creepy children who play and dance around the corpses of their parents. I don't get where's the problem, one phaser blast would solve this situation forever. Well, for some reason they don't consider the children to be suspects, even though they should be immediate and maybe even the only suspects. But McCoy claims that they suffer from partial amnesia. I'm sorry, but how could they forget that their parents are dead when they literally dance around their corpses? In which universe does partial amnesia make sense? Why are the children not the main suspects again? Especially when the oldest kid, their leader, is played by Craig Huxley or Handley or however you want to call him. In this episode he plays Tommy, the son of uh, old man Starnes, but he also played Kirk's nephew Peter in Operation Annihilate. Later he became a jazz musician, he created the so-called blaster beam and played it in Star Trek motion picture, Star Trek 2 and Star Trek 3, before becoming a documentary filmmaker and a Hollywood producer. McCoy beams with the kids on the ship, but Kirk and Spock want to stay and explore the near cave, after they heard Starnes' tapes. The tapes say that all of the adults suffered from anxiety, but not their children. When they go to the cave, Kirk gets a sudden panic attack, which stops after he leaves it. And Shatner's overacting in this episode is legendary, and also pretty memeable. Back on the Enterprise we get a vital scene, the children get ice cream. And the weirdest boy of them all is sad because he got two white types of ice cream, and that makes him sad. So Nurse Chapel gives him a better ice cream. I'm sorry dear episode, but why are you wasting my time? I don't care if the kid gets the correct type of ice cream. What does it have to do with the mystery of their parents being dead? Were they trying to suggest that the kids killed the parents because they didn't give them the correct type of ice cream or what? When the children are alone, finally something starts to happen. They start something which looks like some kind of a satanic ritual, together with a demonic chant, and suddenly a so-called friendly angel named Gorgon appears, and I must say, every scene with Gorgon is painful to watch. After Gene Roddenberry saw his scenes, he demanded that his voice will be distorted and his appearance will be masked by the green effect. I mean, he's not intimidating, he looks embarrassing. He's basically a talentless fat guy dressed up in something which looks like a shower curtain. I had to look up who the hell the guy is and how did he get the job and it's very interesting. His name is Melvin Belly and he wasn't an actor, he was a defense attorney. Journey. He had clients like Jakob Rubenstein, who probably most people know as Jack Ruby, the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald on live television, or Mick Jagger. And why did he get the job? Well, when his son Caesar was cast as the boy who doesn't like white ice cream, he asked if he uh, can't get a role too, and Fred Freiberger, the new season 3 showrunner, was like, sure, having a celebrity will help the ratings, and he gave him the role of the main 
villain. See, in Hollywood, it's not important if you're talented, it is important if people know you. Tommy gets to the bridge, where Kirk and Spock are watching through his dad's recordings, and then he does something very strange. It looks like he is jerking off an invisible elephant, and that somehow gives him magic powers, I guess. There must be a very interesting invisible elephant. This time he manages to stop the playback of a computer recording with an analog TV tuning out type of signal. Okay, sure, why not? Kirk and Spock want to go to finish the tapes in privacy, but Tommy asks them if they could bring the kids to Marcos 12, where Tommy has apparently relatives. Do all of the kids have relatives there? Kirk refuses to do so, so Tommy asks if he can stay on the bridge. And Kirk agrees. Why? Tommy is a civilian, and the only civilians Kirk tolerates on the bridge are hot blondes. Why does he allow Tommy there? As soon as Kirk and Spock leave, Tommy uses his invisible elephant jerking off powers to force Sulu to change course to Marcos 12, even though he still thinks he sees the planet on screen. When Uhura, however, turns to the screen, she notices that they're not on orbit anymore, so they have to work on her too. Scotty, meanwhile, finds out in the auxiliary room that they're not in orbit anymore, so the kids deal with him too, but in a different way. They let him fight his engineers. Kirk decides to send two security officers down to Triacus and to beam back the officers which were there originally. They beam the new officers down, but they can locate the previous security members. That's how Spock and Kirk find out that they're not on orbit anymore, which means that Kirk has sent the two officers into space. He has basically killed them for no reason. I bet that he will suffer long-lasting psychological consequences, because he cares about his crew so much, right? Or maybe it won't be mentioned anytime again, and it won't have any effect on him at all. Kirk is not very kirk in this episode. Kirk and Spock go to the bridge, where the children are doing their little ritual, and Uhura looks at them with that, oh, that's so cute look. Why? If I saw a bunch of children chanting basically Hail Satan, I wouldn't find it cute, I would find it pretty scary, but this is for the first time that Kirk sees Gorgon, and he doesn't again do anything. Again, Kirk is very weird in this episode, he doesn't even try to communicate with the alien intruder, he acts like it's completely normal to see a glowing freak on his bridge. The kids, based on C Gorgon's instructions, place fear into the crew's heads. So, what is everybody afraid of? Well, Sulu is apparently afraid that huge swords flying in space will somehow damage the Enterprise. Ah, <sighs> this is so stupid that it makes Star Trek Discovery make sense. So Sulu doesn't want to obey orders, so Kirk orders Uhura to send a, a report to Starfleet, and now we see Uhura's fear. When she looks into the mirror, she sees herself looking very old. That's okay, many women, and to be fair also men, are afraid of that, but why does the mirror disappear from some shots? So Kirk orders it to Spock, but Spock refuses it to do, because he thinks everything is okay. So wait, Spock's greatest fear is that he will be an optimist? I'm sorry, what sense does it make? So Kirk orders uh, Mr. Leslie to arrest the kids, but then something happens and I don't understand what. I think that the sound engineer has reversed Kirk's speech, but uh, what is happening in the story? First I thought that Tommy has changed Leslie's mind, so that he doesn't understand what Kirk is saying, but based on Spock's facial reactions, I guess that he too can't understand Kirk. So did Tommy change everybody's minds? Or did he somehow change uh, Kirk's mind? Apparently not, because Spock will fix it. By mind man melding with himself or something? And why is Leslie looking at him so weird? Why does he give Kirk that no sir, you can't kiss me type of look? This whole scene is fascinating to me and I have no clue what is happening. Then Tommy starts to change Kirk's mind. Kirk does something weird, I guess he's supposed to be afraid. But uh, why does he behave like he just pissed himself and is trying not to crap his pants too? At least Kirk's fear makes sense. 
he's afraid that he's losing control of his ship, but that's actually not logical. He is really losing control of his ship. So this fear is not that logical as it looked a few seconds ago. Well, at least Shatner's legendary overacting on the bridge and in the turbo lift is, well, legendary. Both Spock and Kirk start to behave normally as soon as they get away from the bridge. So what, do the powers of the kids have limited reach or limited range? Anyway, they want to get help from Scotty, uh, but he threatens to kill them now, even though a few minutes ago he was on their side. So what about some consistency? Then Tommy brings to them Chekhov and uh, two red chairs, because Chekhov thinks he got an order from Starfleet to arrest them. And because he's a good officer, he always complies with the orders. I mean, every time the script demands it. But three guys are no match to Kirk's fists and kicks and to Spock's phaser. When Tommy notices that he lost, he runs away in panic. And then we see him in the next scene, sitting on the bridge in the captain's chair, like like nothing happened. Did they cut out some scene or did the continuity person fall asleep? Kirk demands the kids to call the friendly angel, but they refuse to recite the required stuff, so Spock plays a recording of that chant. Wait, what? So it's not actually that little ritual thingy which summons the Gorgon, but only the sound of the chant? So why did they do the hand thing to keep themselves entertained? Or did they think they're getting fed and they need some exercise? Gorgon comes and tries to manipulate them, but Spock has something more powerful. A recording of the colonists having fun with their children. The children smile while watching the footage, so Spock cuts to them being dead. What a killjoy. Joy, to say it politely. So the children start to cry and Gorgon's face starts to melt. I'm sorry, but what is happening? And the more they cry, the more his face melts. And then he disappears? I'm really desperately trying to understand how these things work. Um, I'm really trying to make some sense out of it all, but nothing does make sense. And when Gorgon disappeared, uh, all of the fears disappeared with him and everybody's normal suddenly? So who actually had the power? Did the children have the power or was it Gorgon? Do the children still have their powers? If so, why is everybody normal? Are the children the good guys now? Well, at least the episode ends. And not a minute too soon. The first few minutes, basically before Gorgon appears uh, for the first time, are very promising. I like the premise of this story and I think it had a potential for a good scary story. But I just hate scripts where nothing makes any sort of sense. What exactly are the powers of Gorgon? Were the children somehow involved with the deaths of their parents? Did the Gorgon die in the end or just disappear to search for some other minions? And why does he wear a shower curtain? Why does Kirk act like uh, he would uh, in a bad fanfiction instead of acting like Kirk we all know and love? I'm not also a fan of children in movies or TV shows, but these kids at least tried, so I won't be too harsh. At least the main boy was a decent actor. The Asian boy is Brian Toshi, who later appeared in the Next Generation episode Night Terrors, but he also starred in movies like Revenge of the Nerds or Police Academy 3 and 4, and he also played Leonardo in the 1990s uh, live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. So he and Huxley later had an actual career. The other kids at least tried. But that's probably the most polite thing I can say about this episode, that all of them at least tried. This episode is dumb. That's really all I can say. Basically everything about this episode is wrong. What I like is the creepy atmosphere, which it has during the first few minutes. And that's it. I think personally that this is one of the worst original series episodes ever. The sad thing is that during the first few minutes you will feel it could actually be good. On my standard scale from 0 to 10, where 0 is complete garbage, 5 is average and 10 is a masterpiece, I would give this episode 1 out of 10. It's stupid. Very, very stupid. But if you watch it drunk, Shatner's overacting can be pretty funny. Anyway, as always, these were just my opinions. Feel free to let me know what do you think about this episode down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button and come back soon. I will try to upload 
upload uh, tomorrow again some deleted stuff and then the next video I'm working on right now is a quick thoughts on video about the next episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called We'll Always Have Paris which should be up early next week. So thank you very much for watching and see you very soon. Bye.